News broke that the National Association of Black Journalists would host former President Trump at their annual conference happening in Chicago this week. A fiery debate ensued online. Some woke journalists are now against journalism. Kamala unveils her economic agenda, and a TikToker explains why she calls herself the white woman whisperer. All this and so much more is coming up on today's episode of Brad vs. Everyone, my daily podcast where I take on the craziest ideas from across the internet and across our politics from a center-right, independent perspective. If you're new here, please do consider subscribing and sticking around, and regardless, don't forget to hit that like button and do comment with your thoughts as we go along. I do read the comments, and I pick a few to respond to in every episode. Now up first, we've got to talk about a mini-drama and scandal unfolding in the world of journalism. An announcement this week by the National Association of Black Journalists that former President Donald Trump would be speaking and interviewed at a panel they are hosting has been met with widespread outrage and even some resignations from people high up in the organization. Now, you wouldn't think that journalists interviewing a politician would be a particularly remarkable or controversial piece of news. It's the kind of thing that happens all the time, and it's just a typical part of journalism. But it nonetheless has sparked widespread backlash from people who don't think they should be platforming Donald Trump. Let's take a listen to some local news coverage. News broke that the National Association of Black Journalists would host former President Trump at their annual conference happening in Chicago this week. A fiery debate ensued online between members of the organization. While some journalists welcomed the idea of grilling the former president, others pushed back flooding social media with frustration about the decision. It even led the co-chair for the convention, Karen Atia, to step down. Journalist and NABJ member April Ryan called it a slap in the face to black women journalists. Are you going to include the Congressional Black Caucus? Sharing this highlight reel of her contentious run-ins with Trump over the years. You talk about somebody that's a loser. She doesn't know what the hell she's doing. I can understand how she feels disrespected. But I think in the end, it's really important for us as journalists not to be partisan. Ava Thompson Greenwell is a journalism professor at Northwestern University who is also a member of NABJ. She sees the controversial panel conversation with Trump as an opportunity. We need the journalists to hold his feet to the fire and to ask those difficult questions. So that's what I'm going to be looking for tomorrow. A sentiment shared by NABJ President Ken Lemon, who says panelists will be fact-checking as the former president speaks. For us as journalists, people who go into and have very uncomfortable conversations for the sake of our members, this is an important time. I'm still struggling to believe that this is actually a controversy and that people actually resigned from the organization and gave them backlash for the crime of journalists doing journalism. I mean, whether you like him or not, Donald Trump is the former president of the United States. He's the Republican candidate for president and a potential likely next president of the United States. He's arguably the most famous person in the world. So there is literally zero argument that he is not newsworthy or not worth covering or not worth platforming or anything like that. And there's an absurd arrogance behind this notion that, well, people shouldn't be able to hear from somebody who us benevolent, wise journalists don't like and think is bad. I mean, you're going to have a whole panel of journalists on stage with him who can push back on him if he makes false claims, if he falsely claims the election was stolen in 2020. You can point out fact checks, point to court decisions that went against him on that subject, and so much more. You can ask tough questions. You can ask about his controversial comments about race over the years. You can ask him about black voters and issues important to the black community. You can ask him about his conflicts with April Ryan or other black journalists. All of these things are you, the things that you can do in an interview. You can't do any of those things if you just point blank refuse to engage with somebody because you disagree with them. Now, obviously, there is a limit. There are some people that are so fringe and so crazy and so extreme that they're not really worth interviewing or platforming in a journalistic setting. But no matter how extreme you find them or no matter how much you disagree with them, the presidential nominee of a major party 
is absolutely mainstream and important and worth scrutinizing and engaging with. And if you don't get that, you don't belong in journalism. You belong in PR or working for a politician. There's also an element of this where I almost feel bad for Trump because he really is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. If he refused their invitation and declined to participate, they'd be like, wow, he won't speak to black journalists. That's so racist of him. But when he accepts the invitation, there's uproar over him accepting it and him having been invited in the first place and people saying they shouldn't speak to him. From his perspective, you really can't win. And I just, on a fundamental a level, I really can't relate to these journalists who just strike me as fundamentally cowardly. I would love the opportunity to interview an AOC or a Kamala Harris or a Donald Trump, and I'm confident in my ability to hold their feet to the fire, to be tough but fair, to ask them questions about things other people haven't asked about, to pin them down on the issues, to highlight contradictions and, contra and contrasts. And not only would I be willing to do that, I'd be eager to do it because that's part of what being a journalist is. It really is astonishing. There's a book out recently by a former New York Times reporter, Nellie Bowles, where she explains this, but it really is astonishing just the extent to which mainstream legacy media has been captured by people who, mainstream media has always been liberal. So it's not that they're liberal, it's that they're so far left and they're so ideological that they have a different view of journalism, one that bears basically no resemblance to traditional liberal journalism. They don't view ideas and figures as worthy of scrutiny and interrogation, but as worthy of derision and deplatforming. They don't view themselves as purveyors of truth, as inquisitive minds meant to ask questions about things people are interested in. They view themselves as arbiters of truth, as the people who can decide what ideas or arguments or people the, the small folk can handle being exposed to. And that's what rubs me the wrong way about all of this. But honestly, shout out to the National Association of Black Journalists and their president for sticking to their decision and actually doing journalism. And the people who are rage quitting the organization because how dare they platform Trump? Well, frankly, it's good that they're leaving because they don't have any place and they really shouldn't be involved in any organization that purports to do journalism at all. Up next, Kamala Harris just outlined her economic agenda in a campaign speech, and I have questions. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. On day one, I will take on price gouging and bring down costs. We will ban more of those hidden fees and surprise late charges that banks and other companies use to pad their profits. We will take on corporate landlords and cap unfair rent increases. And we will take on Big Pharma to cap prescription drug costs for all Americans. Our plan will lower costs and save many middle-class families thousands of dollars a year. But Donald Trump has a different plan in mind, one that would raise prices on middle-class families so I have a lot to say about all this. First and foremost, oh, you're going to bring down prices? But I thought you guys already brought down inflation and that it was never in your control in the first place. Which is it? Y'all, I'm getting whiplash here a little bit. And again, guys, inflation did not have anything to do with price gouging. This is a totally economically illiterate nonsense notion pushed by far left economic activists, but it never made any sense. And it's contradicted by data. Companies are always greedy. They're always charging as much as they can or whatever price will maximize their profits. That didn't change suddenly in 2021. What did change were global supply chain issues because of the pandemic and government lockdowns, massive injections of 
trillions of dollars in stimulus spending into economies and huge expansions of the money supply by central banks like the Federal Reserve. Those are the actual causes of inflation. And to be fair, not all of them were directly under the Biden administration's control or influence. And in a similar fashion, banning or restricting junk fees isn't going to do anything. Even if banks or other institutions can't charge additional fees at the end or whatever, those costs will just be added to original prices. Maybe that's better or more convenient in some ways, I honestly don't know. But you're not making any difference to how much things cost. But please, give yourself a huge pat on the back for that one. And capping rent increases is an idea known as rent control. It is almost universally rejected by economists because it's failed just about everywhere it's ever been tried. The predictable effect will just be to further constrain and reduce the supply of housing, making the housing shortage that's causing high prices in the first place worse not better. It'll also reduce the quality of the housing that gets supplied and the maintenance and amenities that landlords offer, all while doing absolutely nothing to address the root cause of high housing costs in America, which is a limited supply of housing because our government hampers the market and makes it so difficult to build and bring to market new housing supply. In the same way, the whole notion of price caps on prescription medications is incredibly misleading and problematic. Yes, the cost of many prescription drugs is way too high, and we can and we should talk about different ways to address that. One thing I think we should do is free up the importation of drugs where the same drug is sold in other countries at much lower prices, approved by similar or stricter regulatory agencies, we should be able to import it. That competition would lower drug prices. But imposing price caps has to mean one of two things. Either the government sets mandatory prices that companies can't charge more than, in which case you will have shortages of key medicines. That's what happens when you impose literal price caps. And the U.S. leads the way in pharmaceutical and drug innovation, in part because of the profits that can be made by inventing new drugs. When you hamper that, you will hamper that innovation. But if by price caps, what she really means is that they are allowed to charge us whatever price they want, but consumers will pay a certain amount and then taxpayers pay the rest, which is what the Biden administration has meant in the past when they talk about price caps on prescription drugs. Well, that's again, not saving us any money. We all pay taxes. We're all on the hook for the national debt and its economic consequences. So we're just going to pay for it that way instead. I don't see how that's better. There is a theme here, guys. Kamala is clearly all about more government meddling in our economy and more micromanagement of our economic system. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked and it won't work. Now, the one point I will give her is at the end when she talks about Trump's plans. Trump is campaigning on a 10% flat tariff across the board, which is a terrible idea. It would raise costs by thousands of dollars for families on basically everything they buy and rely on. So if you're somebody who actually wants to see policy solutions that help Americans and make life more affordable, you're kind of shit out of luck at the moment. Up next, it's time for Brad versus TikTok, my segment where I take on the craziest ideas from the clock app. If you're new here, make sure you're subscribed and do remember to hit that like button while you're at it. Now, let's take a look at one TikToker making a video for white women. And this is an individual who calls herself the white woman whisperer. Yep, I'm, I'm not making that up. Let's take a listen to what she has to say. Are you being yelled at by people on the internet? Have you put out an apology not being received so well? Hi, I am here to help. My name is White Woman Whisperer. I, don't run, don't run, it's okay, all right? I'm here just to help you get through these troubling times and realize you are going to be okay, okay? Look, I have a cute dog. I'm not, I'm not scary, I'm not scary. I'm here to help you. You're gonna stop, drop, and scroll, okay? Whatever you are doing, you're just gonna stop. You're gonna stop typing. You're gonna, you're gonna drop that ego. You're just gonna drop all the, all the, those explain, that ex explanations all explaining you wanna do. Drop. We're just gonna drop. I hear you, I hear you. I do, I do, I do. Your intentions, drop it. Drop it. And you're just gonna scroll through some comment sections. Ideally on black women's pages, you are going to learn so much. 
it's going to be so hard. People are going to be misunderstanding you. But future you will thank you, I promise. And, and know that you're going to be all right. People mess up. Look how cute my dog is. If someone has brought this to your attention, that means they care about you and think you can do better. If we didn't think you could do better, we would go talk about you where you can't see. <laughs> uh, so I will give her that her dog is cute. And I did find the comment at the end about how if we didn't think you could do better, we'd talk about you where you can't see. I did find that a little bit funny, I will be honest. But I cannot stand how condescending and infantilizing this woke content constantly is. I mean, she's talking down to white women as if they are toddlers. But for some bizarre reason, some libbed out white women in the comments are eating this shit up. One writes, present me thanks you for the future me I am working on. Another says, thank you for showing me how much I still have to learn. Another says, you are a true gem. Another person says, yay, we're going to be all right and learn better. Another person says, I adore you. I learn from you and thank you. <clears throat> Ladies, if you have a humiliation kink, keep that in the bedroom. We don't need to see that. Nobody needs to be having that on full display on TikTok. The idea that somebody would actually brand themselves as white woman whisperer is freaking crazy to me. You mean like a dog whisperer? <laughs> like your job is to explain things to the simple little white women who can't understand and break it down real easy for their little low IQ racist brains. That is so offensive. It's so condescending. It's so patronizing. <laughs> How does anyone find this content relatable or pleasant or enjoyable in any way? I'm not even a white woman and I find it maddening and, and frankly offensive. <laughs> and I just don't understand how the people on the left, the progressive TikTok crowd, think this kind of thing in any way, shape, or form advances racial harmony or racial progress. If you ask me, it just doubles down on the divisions between the racial groups and heightens these divides between people that, if you ask me, we should all honestly just want to see fade into the background, fade into irrelevance. But instead, they're making them the defining aspects of human life and constantly reinforcing race as a meaningful divide between people. How is that progress? How is that woke? I just don't get it. I just don't get why there's an audience for this content. And TikTok never ceases to amaze me. With the new levels of Delulu, it's just constantly reaching. You guys let me know what you think, especially my many white female viewers and listeners. Let me know. Do you enjoy listening to the white woman whisperer? I do want to hear from you. And now, before we wrap up today's show, I'll read a few of your comments from the last episode. One person says, do you actually think there's hope for political tension to cool down? I swear it feels like left and right are living in separate realities. You know, in one sense, no, I don't feel a ton of hope. But I guess if I zoom out, I do feel some hope because at many points in our country in the past, things have been far worse. We had widespread political violence in the streets. We even had a freaking civil war, for goodness sakes. And we somehow hung together and got through it all. So when I look at things in that context, yes, I still have some hope. But no, in the short term, things be looking pretty darn bleak, if I'm honest. Another person says the male version of this weird Zoom thing is even worse than the other. And that seems nearly impossible. But nope, they did the impossible, I guess. Yeah, I watched the full two and a half hour white women for Kamala Zoom call, whereas I only watched highlights of the men for Kamala Zoom call. So I can't really judge because it wouldn't be fair. But I did cringe more. I, I, I actually think I cringed more in the women for Kamala one. The white dudes one was just more pitiful than anything else. Another person said, talking about the, the white men for Kamala Zoom call, this Zoom call is so full of estrogen, it would lose to Leah Thomas in the women's swimming qualifier. That really did uh, make me laugh. So kudos to you for that one. Another person said, a woman president, how exciting. But what if the woman president is a conservative pro-life Republican? Such women do exist. Yes, many do. And that's part of what's so empty and so 
lacking about this identity politics approach. They're not excited about the idea of a woman president. These people wouldn't be voting for Nikki Haley if it was Nikki Haley versus Joe Biden, for example. Only a very specific kind of woman, which kind of tells you that it's not actually about promoting women at all. Another person says, almost every fiscally conservative person I know, including myself, gives a very large portion of their money to various charities, nature conservation, supporting schools in inner city areas, medical research, etc. Guess who benefits from that? Everyone. Yeah, I do also know a ton of people who give huge amounts to charity, who lean conservative, and I guess I just view that as a more meaningful and more impactful way of spending money to address social problems. I think every dollar given to charity versus a dollar paid in taxes, a lot more good in most cases is going to come out of that dollar going to charity. Another person says, I don't know about you, Brad, but I'm definitely sorry that I own slaves and that I displaced natives and colonized with Christopher Columbus. Yeah, exactly. I feel really bad about all those things I did and was involved intimately in. All right, guys, we'll leave it there for today's episode of Brad versus Everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure that you're subscribed and do hit that like button before you go. Comment with your thoughts. I do read the comments and I take the time to go through them and pick a few to respond to in every episode. And you can listen to this show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your audio podcasts. And if you are doing that, do take a second to rate and review the show. It helps us grow. And with that, we'll talk again tomorrow. Uh,